Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you here. So many people turn up. Thank you very much for coming. My name's David Holloway, and um, I'm from this firm called Terra Seed here. And I'm not quite sure how I got here. There's obviously someone very persuasive <laughs> has managed to get me on the stand here to talk about where I've uh, come from, my little journey, if you like. OK. So as I say, I'm not quite sure how I got here. Life used to be so much simpler when I was a simple horticultural advisor working for uh, the Ministry of Agriculture's Research and Development Organization. It used to be called ADAS, or going back a few years longer, War Ag, or whatever you want to call it. And we used to give technical advice to farmers and growers, to supermarkets, on how to produce better products, how to get away growing things with less chemical and so on. And life was very easy in those heady days of the 1980s. I was over one of 2,000 consultants out there. There used to be 2,500 of us with our research farms, our network of laboratories, all these sorts of wonderful things, talking to little, tiny, humble smallholders and nursery stock producers right the way up through to the major multiple retailers. We used to go into all sorts of countries as the Eastern Bloc came out of uh, you know, problems and just basically advising at all levels within the agricultural industry. So I feel like that's a bit of my background helping farmers, growers, legislators, and all sorts of things. The advice we used to give wasn't, um, was always free, of course, in those days. It wasn't always palatable, but you know, at least it was free. Now, I started as a humble fruit and nursery stock advisor and ended up in that organization as it went through transition, uh, looking after, trying to find opportunities for new markets, new products, right the way across the food and agricultural chain. And it was quite an interesting period of time as we went through from um, a government agency through a next steps agency through to become a, a full-blown commercial organization, ADAS, as it is now. And during that sort of um, change from a government department to a full-blown consultancy research organization, there were a lot of casualties. And I was, if you like, one of those casualties, but I wasn't one of those casualties that ended up with a lovely, great, big, fat redundancy check to throw me out. I was the idiot, basically, that decided to jump and go and do my own thing, which is rather a strange thing to go and do, which is effectively how I've ended up here. It's my journey from this really safe, lovely place to work uh, to the um, little entrepreneur going to do my own bits and pieces. Before I sort of leapt into that abyss of uh, leaving the safe world behind me, I found myself in a very, very privileged position. I had, as I said, this huge consultancy research organization. I was pretty well at the front end of that. And I was basically, on the one hand, telling supermarkets, the major multiple retailers, what could be achieved by their growers, their farmers, and uh, telling them, you know, you can do this if you only use your buying power to do it. And on the other hand, I was telling the farmers and growers what they had to do if they wanted to retain their contracts with the supermarkets. OK, so uh, we were there to make money, and we were playing both sides of the field. But not only that, of course, they needed an audit trail, they needed the product specifications, they needed people to go out in the farms. And that was wonderful. So I was operating in this very, very heady arena where you could go in at almost any level in any organization with sort of pseudo-government back behind you and tell them how to do it better. And we made a big, big difference in the way products are grown. For instance, working in the Ministry of Agriculture environment where they approve pesticides, you know, if they approve a pesticide, they can't say one is no good and the other isn't. But a supermarket can. They can say, you will grow it like this or you won't grow it at all for us. And so our mantra was, whatever was technically possible, feasible, had to become the minimum standard. And so we basically set up a number of supermarket specifications for them, and that's driven all of this whole process going forward. And so, if you like, that's, that's my background until about 10 years ago. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm looking at that. So, operating in this rather rarefied atmosphere, I had an idea, and that that idea was an idea that was about to change my life and explains pretty well everything that I've had to done, done since. But to explain my idea, and clearly you're realizing this is something to do with chemistry, chemicals, pesticides, ways of growing food, you know, what could be done better? And this is where my idea comes from. But to, to explain my idea, I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you a little bit of a chemistry lesson. 
I'll try and keep it very, very simple. Um, but if you understand the chemistry, you'll understand what's happened here. And this, this little slide up here is quite an interesting slide. Because back in the day, many, many years ago, there was a, a herbicide out there called Simazin. I don't know if any of you are horticultural growers or farmers or whatever. You may remember Simazin. But it was one of the very first things that came out that you could spray around your raspberry bushes or wherever you wanted to do. And it would, it would stop weeds growing, just like this. You have a nice firm tilt, it would stop things growing. But the one thing that would happen is if you were to walk across that field, that field, and you would break the surface, you would leave a footprint. And in that footprint, the grass would grow or the weeds would grow. And this is a really curious sort of situation because although you had a, some chemistry going on there, it was actually acting like a physical barrier. If you could imagine, it was like rice paper. You walked on the rice paper, you broke the seal. But you had chemistry acting as a physical barrier. And that always intrigued me, because it wasn't just this one particular pesticide, herbicide in this case. You know, a number of things worked in this way. And so it was this interesting Simazin question which got me thinking, could you actually do something with a physical barrier rather than a chemical barrier? What could, you, could, could something actually be done in that territory? And that... That is where I've been going around. Now, Simazin's no longer with us. It's, uh, you know, resistance, weeds, and all the rest of it, so it's not there. But it's this, this little footprint, which was wonderful. So taking on a step from there and leaving the chemistry behind a bit, what we had is this, uh, this herbicide, this weed chemical, control chemical, acting like a plastic mulch. And mulching like this isn't a particularly complicated thing. You, you can transplant plants through it, it'll control the weeds, it'll do all sorts of you know, nice things, it'll retain moisture, it'll even do something about some disease control. But you can only use it on transplanted plants. You have to put it physically through the, the hole in the ground. And um, you can also think about how barriers are used as well, like in closhing, where you put them over the top of a crop, and you can do interesting things about retaining moisture, heating the soil, all sorts of interesting things like that. You can even make a mesh cloche to keep the pests off. And so sort of my big idea was really to sort of come up with the idea, to think about, well, could you actually combine these with a drill crop in a single product that would actually control weed pests and diseases in one hit as a physical barrier and do away with pesticides? That's not a small idea, that's a, a big idea, basically, if it, could be, if it could be done. This was a monster idea. Could you actually tackle the major agrochemical companies? Could you actually convince farmers and growers that this was something special, this is something that could happen? So that's my idea. I'm sitting there in this wonderful job up there, talking to multiple retailers and so on with an idea as potentially big as that. So before I did anything, I started on literature reviews, searches, patent searches, and all the rest of it. Had anyone tried to do this? Could it be made to work? And of course, no one had ever attempted before. Nothing had happened. So you can see now I'm on a bit of a mission. I can see I have a vision of what could be done, but I'm sitting in a senior position in a major, major company thinking, what do I do about this? So. The first little step was, technically, could it be solved? Could this challenge be resolved? Is it, was it possible to do? And uh, I found that if I put seeds on top of a colored sheet of paper, a little bit like this, very special paper, as it turns out, like this, could I let the seeds germinate through one way but stop weeds coming the other way? Could I retain moisture? Could I heat the soil? Could I do all those things? If I put plastic on the top, could I retain moisture? Could I let the layers separate out like this? Could I make a cloche? And yeah, I can do all of those things. And in this environment here, I can control downy mildew on lettuce. I can control carrot fly in carrots and so on, all those other things. So the technical challenge, although it took a long time to resolve, wasn't the big issue. The big issue was, what do you do with this idea? How do you take it to market? What do you do, having got to this point? And so the big problem was raising the finance to do it, to develop the concept, take it to market. So I knew a number of things, basically. I knew that I had a product that could be made to work, even though perhaps it wasn't particularly sophisticated at the time. It might not be the final version, but there was a solution out there. I knew that pesticide legislation was going to change because the government's withdrawing chemicals as fast as it could get them off the label. The EU are driving things out. Minor crops like lettuce and so on like this were going to struggle. Herbs would be impossible. So there was going to be a change in legislation, and I thought that could 
you know, drive a market opportunity. I also knew from the work with the chemical companies that the rate at which they could introduce new active ingredients was going to diminish. So the, the ingredients were all there for a, a, for a potential business opportunity, but I was still working in, in the company. But they weren't interested in financing my ideas. Remember, this is a next steps government agency going through transition, and you're saying, I need a few million quid to go and develop this idea. You imagine the response you get. So there was nil, nil uh, interest in that. Just get on there and sell another million quid's worth of consultancy for our teams or find work for our laboratories and all this sort of thing. So I got to a position where I felt I just had to put a business plan together and to raise the capital that I would need to actually do this on my own. And uh, I thought it would probably take about 10 years to get this to market and cost, uh, in my business plan, about 3 million quid to do that, which I thought was a pretty realistic sort of assessment. This is not a small little product and not a simple idea. It's a big idea. It should be taken over by Unilever or some monster organization, not a little one-man band jumping out of a, a, a little job. But when I put it to the investment community, uh, the first thing they said, they just laughed at me and said, it's a lovely, lovely idea, of David, but you know, 10 years and three million quid ain't gonna happen. It's not, life is just not like that. What can you do for 500,000 pound in two years to convert this to a product? Um, I naively took the challenge, took the 500,000 from the Southeast Growth Fund, from Cedar, with help from Cedar, and I match funded it with angel investors, individual, people putting money on in, thinking, well, if I manage to get this going, there must be some more money following on be behind it. And so, basically, I, I raised the capital, set the company up, resigned from the job, and basically, off, off we go, trying to do th this sort of thing. And um, I knew that, you know, 500k is not going to go very far, or a million pounds, as it turned out. And so, basically, I set about rushing around the world with my new idea, with my little prototype machine, with my little roll of seed mat under my, under my belt. And I went off to America. There's America, there's America. I went off to Portugal, to Spain, to Germany, Australia, all sorts of other countries, showing them how this technology could be made to work. Meanwhile, frantically putting money into financing the patents and, and all the rest of it. And there's no doubt that it works. You know, this is a, a trial in Germany. This is the terra seed plots. These are some of the treatments. You know, it works. No, no doubt about it. But the difficulty is not showing it make, make it work. The question is, how on earth do you take it to market? And if you spend a month in America and three or four weeks in each of these countries going on round, or a month in Australia trying to get nowhere you know, without the infrastructure to, to get you there, that, that's the fundamental problem. So it's, it's not an issue of, um, you know, does it work, can it work, are people interested? Is it how, what do you do with this, with this knowledge, this information? And it's quite clear that I didn't have a proper plan for commercialization. And that, that I think, is um, my problem. And how to get from that situation with almost no funds, because you're burning money very, very fast, trying to, to make that happen. Uh, one of the fundamental issues in trying to make this happen is the IP. Because if you haven't got strong intellectual property patents, you, you basically can't raise capital. But if you register your patent, the first thing you do is publish your idea. And so you, you're in a race, effectively, about, um, you know, it's very cheap to start, a couple of hundred pounds to raise a, a, a patent to get going. Uh, yeah. Uh, plus a bit of consultancy, but a year later the renewals start, and then you're working in all these countries. It's international patent, so you, you're suddenly raising, you know, patents in multiple countries. You've got multiple products, as you can see, and you're suddenly running into patent bills, running into tens of thousands of pounds a year. Um, uh, as a little tiny company, that that becomes a very very challenging problem. But without the patent, you've got a problem. And so. Of course, there's the cost to defend the patents as well. So how on earth do you do this as a tiny little company when you're spending all your money? How do you, you, you raise the money to make the patents? Now, after about 10 years of this lot, <laughs> rushing around the world doing all of these things, I had 26 granted patents. I had um, all of which had to be looked after, no income to do them. So I had to set up a trading business. We started growing seed in the stuff you put up on roofs to finance the business and doing consultancy and things like that. So I'm running two businesses now. One is a horticultural growing business. One is, is, is the new R&D type companies. 
but you can't rely on angel investors every time you start getting in trouble to come in and put more money in every time you, you, you hit the wall to finance the next round of you know, patent renewals or the next opportunity and so on. So you actually have to do something about it. Uh, you, you realize unless you've got some leverage somewhere, uh, you're going to fail. No matter how good you are, how brilliant your products are, how much vision you've got, you're going to fail. And my turning point to, between this sort of great idea, you know, <laughs> lost in, 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 in all the rest of it, was when um, one of my patented products is actually this particular product here, a paper-based one with no plastic on, hit a farmer in Denmark, a monster grower, one of the huge, huge farmers who, uh, you know, 1,000 hectare salad producer, who grew understand, saw the product and said, mm, that works for me and basically converted his whole operation across to uh, growing on my paper. So there's the paper, there's the crop. And basically, uh, very straightforwardly switched his business over and didn't bother growing, didn't bother with pesticide other than a bit of herbicide down the middle of the rows. He was then a, a chemical-free farmer growing on that sort of scale. And so the first thing we were doing then was to, um, you know, tool him up, show him how it could be done, and then he was applying his muscle and I use this slide to show you the sort of scale of tractors we're dealing with. He's into mega agricultural business. He's Jiddingrant in, in Denmark. But of course, I'm manufacturing him for him now in the UK on my little tiny pilot plant, trying to keep up with this, becoming a high volume, low margin manufacturer. And that, that then has its own problems. How, how do I make a profit out of that when all of a sudden he's taking it by the container load? I can't cope. I'm just a little one man band with a couple of weeks and a few investors. So this is how it changed, basically. Yiddingron basically saying, well, why don't you build me a machine and I'll pay you a, a royalty, a license fee. And so we, we built him a, a monster machine to basically grow his crops. This is what the crop looks like when it's growing. Completely weed-free, basically, and again, no herbicides, no chemistry at all. That, that's what we're achieving. So um, we then came to a deal. This is uh, Soren Flink Madsen from Yiddingron. Um, this is me, this is the machines I built for him to manufacture the products, the cedar here, the air drive, the machine comes on through and makes giant sized rolls of this stuff which go off on out. And so from that point onwards, the nature of the business changed. It changed from me running around realizing I have just can't do it to uh, all I have to do is empower the people I'm working with to do what needs to be done for me. And from that moment on, from this handshake, the nature of the business has changed. Okay, there's teething problems, getting the machinery going, it's complex and all the rest of it. But it's now a business of licensing, not a business of manufacture, which allows me then to concentrate on product development ideas. What do we do? Where's the next step? What's going to happen? So, the next big step on then from getting this basic arrangement going, which is three or four years ago now, was to how to replicate that. How can we replicate a license agreement for the guy in Denmark dealing with Germany, Sweden, and so on, right the way across Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you're back to the same old problem. Am I going to spend my time chasing around the world, trying to convince people to build their own machine, and so on. And so what we've done with, with Soren and Yiddingrant now is we've licensed him, or we've, we've changed the license to allow him to sub-license. The guy who used to work for me, who built the machines with me, now works for Soren and is driving that business through his capital, using his leverage. And so when you, you ask me on the inquiry, do you export, do you do this? I say, no, but you're, you're trading in Europe. I say, yeah, well, do you know about this? And so I say, no, I leave it to these guys to do it because they've got the muscle, they've got the contacts. This chap grows right the way across Europe, contacts everywhere else. We want more machines going anywhere. It's a phone call. You know, you need 250,000 quid for a machine. Well, that's the price of a big tractor. You know, you're dealing in a different league and it, and it happens. So it's really about setting up the arrangement between myself and the guy and using my angel investors that put the money in, all the lawyers and bankers and so on, basically to structure those deals for me such that we can come up to licensing arrangements. So effectively, we become a little bit of a pyramid organization with me generating eyes up, up, up here and others putting those ideas into practice. So that's then changed the nature of the business, and I've been able then to go on and think about, well, what's next? What's going to be the next idea that I can then license and find somebody who can take that forward for me and then benefit in, on, the, on the royalty thing? And so that's really why, if you like, we're here um, on 
uh, the, uh, the glee, not to talk about you know manufacturing salads in, in Denmark and Germany and so on, but what's happened next, what I'm freed up to do, which is then to take those ideas and repackage them into some sort of retail product or a landscape product or whatever else. And so basically we're here uh, launching for the second year a whole range of little products, which, oops, little bee mat products, grow wildflowers in little packets, not giant sized tractors and things like that. And so basically setting up a little business, but this time not trying to do it on my own. I've gone straight to people who can take this into market, who know who the retailers are, uh, who can then put me in touch with the distributors. And so I've saved myself a huge amount of misery by working out a product range and then basically letting others take it to market for me. So last year was our launch year for retail products. We've turned over a quarter of a million, more or less from a complete standing start in the new market, developed half a dozen products. I've managed to buy out my corporate investor and pay them off and get rid of them. And basically all my angel investors are now sort of looking around and thinking, oh, exit, 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 what's, what's going to happen next? So I guess that's really all I've got to say, other than obviously to answer your questions, but uh, if you're going to try and do something big and complex, find people who can do it for you and benefit from a small little bit of a much, much bigger pie rather than trying to think you can conquer the world yourself. I think that's really all I've got to say. I'm very happy to take questions you know, from here or, or afterwards. And come and see us on the BMAT stand.